Welcome everybody to uh, another edition of the Tuesday Turf Talk on the Pro Turf Talk Discord. Today we're joined by Micah Woods and Ryan DeMay to talk about soil tests and soil pH. Kind of what's got the discussion started off is we were getting some discussions on soil pH and liming and what kind or how much to do. And so I kind of just want to start off with the general question of why pH is important for turf grass and what sort of range we should be shooting for. Do we flip a coin? Who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> either I call either it, way. I, I call it heads. Uh, I'm, well, I, first I want to say I'm uh, honored to be here with, uh, with you, Evie, and, and with uh, Dr. Woods. It's always good to sit down and, and talk turf with people that know it and love it. Yeah, so... You know, from a from a standpoint of uh, you know homeowners to sports field managers, which I think is sort of the range of of listeners that we have, you know, soil pH is important to all those folks because uh, as we you know attempt to start to to manage turf grass and not just let it you know uh, be in its natural state, so to speak, uh, we know that there are uh, important steps that we can take to uh, you know choose the right fertilizers. Uh, make soil test recommendations you know work better for us if we understand ph first and how that influences the plant and uh, nutrient relationship that's in the soil and so uh i'll let dr woods explain you know the ins and outs of hydrogen ions and why those are so important and how we can manipulate some of those but from a, a purely uh, practitioner standpoint if you if you try to go and start managing uh, grass without really understanding pH at first and what that uh, level is, uh, you're really just guessing as far as what you might be able to uh, achieve with your programs. Micah, what what percentage <clears throat> would you give as far as how important pH is in the grand scheme of your soil tests? Well, you guys put me on the spot because I <laughs> didn't really prepare for this at all and didn't even know I would be speaking or if I'd be able to join. And then you want me to start talking about hydrogen ion activity. <laughs> I didn't and, know either. <laughs> explaining it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I may not have so much to add to the discussion, but I, I'm just going to say uh, 25%, and it's easy to understand because the four primary things that I think are important to look on a soil test report, you want to know the soil pH, you want to know the soil organic matter, you want to know the phosphorus and you want to know the potassium. So uh, in that context, if there's four things that we're looking for, then I'm going to assign a 25% equal weight to each one. I mean, that's just a, that's an easy way to answer it because I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, but um, I think that pH sometimes gets over overemphasized. You know, I, I don't know how many of you guys saw the article that was published by some researchers from the soil science department at the University of Wisconsin. You know, it just came out. I was going to ask you about that. But I think everybody who's even a little bit interested in turf and is, has uh, read a textbook about it or glanced at a textbook about it or looked uh, at some of the online resources or the fact sheets from universities, they'll have seen that chart that has a soil pH on the horizontal axis so that it would be acid at the far left and it would be alkaline at the far right. So you'd have like going from pH 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then in the middle of the chart, you'd be at 7 and then going all the way over to 14 on, on the right side. And then you've got all the elements as these bars and the bars are going across. So you've got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, and so on. And those bars change width based on what the pH is. And I, I think a lot of people have seen that very famous pH chart, and it's supposed to be a relative indication of nutrient availability relationships that you can expect to see at different soil pHs. That was originally done, I think, by somebody Chirag. at the university. Yeah, no, and, it, it, well, he did it based on, there was a guy from the University of Virginia, I think, who did it like 10 years earlier. And that was like in the 1930s, or I think the original one was from the 1930s. And then Truog uh, generalized it a little bit more, uh, maybe in the 1940s. So anyway, some derivation of that particular chart has stuck around 
forever and it becomes really common and people take it like it's the Bible, but actually it's irrelevant. And that's what that particular recent article, which uh, if anybody wants it, shoot me an email, which you can find on my website, AsianTurfGrass.com. You can, and I will send you a copy because it's behind a paywall, but it's interesting. And it, so I'm going to give uh, a general answer that in one way, pH is very important because I said that's one of the key things that you want to know on a soil test report. But I'm also saying that those nutrient uh, availability relationships are not quite as set in stone as people might think. And there's one more article I want to recommend, which is a review article by a couple of well-known soil scientists, um, Sumner and Yamada. And I think it was published in 2002 or something like that. And it's a review article called Farming with Acidity. And they go through so much literature from all around the world, research on agricultural crops, and they come to the conclusion that there's no benefit to liming above pH 5.5. So why do I think pH is still important? Well, uh, if you're below pH 5.5, then you'll have reduced soil microbial activity, which can be a problem and lead to reduced thatch breakdown, which in turf grass is quite a big problem. One of the biggest examples of this, or one of the clearest examples of this that I've seen is at the park grass experiment at Rothamsted Experiment Station in Harpenden, England, just north of London. And they've got these plots that have been fertilized with the same fertilizer year after year since 1856. So it's uh, many years that this has been going on, and some of those receive ammonium sulfate year after year. Ammonium sulfate is an acidifying fertilizer, and they have some plots that have been limed and some plots that have been unlimed. So they've got plots there that have been fertilized every year with ammonium sulfate since 1856, and the soil pH in those plots is now about 3.7, I believe. And the ones that get the highest rates of ammonium sulfate, you can peel the thatch layer off. There's, there's absolutely no connection between the roots and the soil because the soil is so acid that the roots won't go down. And the soil is also so acid and the thatch is so acid that the thatch doesn't decompose. The microbial activity is not high enough to decompose it. So that's a huge problem that happens as the soil pH gets lower. So it's really important when managing any kind of turf grass to make sure that your soil pH is not trending down into that direction. And then the other big thing that you will see as the pH gets a little bit higher, you'll start to get, uh, let's say, you know, the pH is above seven, it's 7.5, 7.7, 7.9. Now the iron availability will be reduced, especially if the soil is dry, I think. And so you'll get something called uh, iron chlorosis, Chlorosis. where the grass turns a little bit yellow. So it's it's important to know, for example, if if your soil pH is 7.7 and your grass starts turning yellow at the end of the summer, then you're like, you can you can kind of assume that it's probably an iron issue and that can easily be fixed by spraying iron and you don't have to start freaking out that it's um, leaf spot or pythium or something <laughs> like that, right? So, so knowing what your pH is gives you some indication of the likelihood of certain uh, micronutrient issues that might occur. And another indication of pH, if your soil pH is up to 8.5, that's pretty normal. That would just indicate that you have some free calcium carbonate or or so, some of your soil particles are actually calcium carbonate, lime. But once the soil pH goes above 8.5, you know that something else is going on. And when that, that something else is almost almost certainly related to sodium, and that would be an indication of an alkalinity hazard. So if you know that your pH is 8.3, that can be expected to be normal. 8.4, that's expected to be normal. It may not be ideal, but it's normal. But if your pH is 8.6 or 8.7, you know that there's something else going on and you might want to deal with treating your irrigation water or acidifying things. And uh, the, the one other thing that, that comes to my mind about soil pH is certain uh, soil-borne disease issues 
which I'm I'm not a plant pathologist, but I know that there's a lot of uh, summer patch. Mm -hmm. I think is affected by pH. Take all patch uh, is affected by pH, and take all patch or various diseases that are uh, maybe caused by the same fungal pathogen that is kind of ubiquitous across warm and cool season grasses, and that is going to tend to be more of a disease risk as your pH is a little bit higher. So that is my that is my off the cuff discussion of. Uh, what I think about soil pH. So generally, I want to keep soil pH between 5.5 and less than 8.5. And, and, and I want to know what it is. And then I, it, it can be hard to change yeah. um, well, depending on, on your soil's buffering capacity. Exactly. So to me, say I get a soil test and it tells me my pH, how would I go you know, let's say, let's start, I guess, on the low end. Let's say I, my soil pH comes in at a 5 or a 5.4. How would I go about determining how to adjust it? Um, what types of lime, how much at a time, that sort of thing. Yeah, so in the general sense of, you know, most of the soil testing labs in the United States are going to give you a lime requirement based on uh, the amount of uh, calcium carbonate equivalent that you need to apply directly to the turf. Now, what you need to be careful about is sometimes they'll give you that recommendation as a complete seasonal number, right, of what you need to do. And some will give you recommendations on the number of applications and the rates uh, thereof. And so it's really important to look at how that number is being reported because different labs uh, will do that and report that number differently. That all being said, uh, you know, really we've got two main sources that we'll talk about here, just calcitic lime, right? So. Uh, a basic calcium carbonate, and you'll see different forms of this uh, in terms of, you know, just regular ag lime, right, which is just uh, finely crushed limestone, all the way up to uh, there's different commercially available products that have, you know, some really cool narrative and marketing pitch behind them, but they, you know, they really don't give you any more uh, added benefit necessarily in terms of uh, what they're able to do in the soil. Uh, the other consideration you might have is for uh, dolomitic lime. Dolomitic lime is going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of like 35 to 42 or so percent uh, magnesium in it. So if your soils are low in magnesium, uh, you know, that's you know a, a route that you can go. One thing to throw in there and add is that, uh, you know, sometimes we'll see people um, make the case that, oh, you need to use um, gypsum either to, you know, uh, move or displace, you know, hydrogen ions. You'll hear people say that. You'll also hear people say that, well, it's got calcium in it. Obviously, it's going to raise my pH, and that's not the case. The reaction that uh, gypsum has in the soil uh, is not one that would uh, raise pH. So just to, you know, dispel those those myths, uh, I think it's important there and understand, you know, both the, the source of your information and uh, any marketing that might be behind it as well, because that does happen some, from time to time. Now, that all being said, you know, if you if you do have that situation where you're at a 5.5, five, I mean, from a purely practical standpoint, uh, you know, it's going to take a while to move that needle. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, you know, as Micah said, it's a difficult, uh, a difficult task ahead of you to get yourself uh, into a range of, uh, you know, say, in the, lo in the low sixes even. So, uh, you know, typically starting out, I think you'd see recommendations somewhere in the neighborhood of about 25 pounds per thousand square feet of lime, uh, most likely with at least two applications in a year, possibly three. And uh, again, you know, trying to space those applications out. Also be cognizant of, uh, you know, when you're making your fertilizer apps, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, there can be some interaction there, uh, especially if you're using urea-based, urea as your nitrogen source, uh, where you can have some uh, volatilization, denitrification, right, with, uh, with high pH at the surface. So just keep that in mind as well, just to make sure that as you're planning out, you know, any type of applications, both fertilizer and uh, pH adjustments, that those are, you know, spaced out well enough apart, say at least four weeks, and and that's a good start. But, you know, from that uh, pragmatic point of view of, you know, if, if you have low pH soil, I think Mike has said it best is, you know, the number one thing is don't freak out. You know, uh, grass is a poverty plant. It's grown in, in, in all uh, seven continents and, you know, six of them pretty well. And it's, it is a highly adaptable plant. So, uh, you know, there's certain species, you know, both cool and warm season that do better in alkaline soils mm -hmm. and, and are a little bit more tolerant. 
and same thing on uh, the cool season side. So, you know, understanding the grass that you have and, um, you know, making sure that you're playing to the strengths, I think that'd be important. But, you know, to that point on the 5.5, uh, and I, I like Micah's assessment there of sort of the 25, uh, 25, 25, 25, 25 plan, you know, the to look at, uh, you know, PK, uh, OM, and um, PH, because, yeah, those are all going to drive some uh, decision making, right, and, and help you make a better decision about which products you're going to use. So particularly if you have a, a pH of 5.5, one thing you're going to stay away from, uh, hopefully, is, you know, ammonium sulfate as a nitrogen source, right? So understanding, you know, just that basic principle, even if you're, you know, new to this and, and considering, hey, what does this all mean? You know, just by making that simple choice of, uh, you know, pH to nitrogen source selection, that's a crucial one in and of itself. Um, you know, Mike, Mike referenced the park grass experiment. A uh, great thing that he's brought to light, you know, in his in his blog over the years and, and shown that, you know, again, over time, these are the things that happen. You know, we write about them in textbooks or read about them in textbooks, and it's hard to sometimes visualize that, but what a what an awesome way to do that and see uh, some of that. So I'd encourage you to go over to uh, his blog over at the Asian Turf Grass Center and check that out. Look up the park grass experiment. It's uh, pretty telling of the, the concepts that we're talking about right here. Yeah, and, if, if you want to talk about species, like the the standard recommendation to keep a pH between six point five and seven, and and supply complete fertilizer like N and P and K, that leads to a lot of weeds. And if you if you put a little bit more stress on it by applying less P, less K, um, still adding nitrogen in suitable amounts, maybe letting the pH get a little bit low a lot of the weed problems go away. And that's something that you would see with your own eyes uh, if you go check out the park grass experiment, which is pretty striking. One thing I wanted to touch on, I know you know you had mentioned um, your fertilization. You also want to be careful with liming around seeding time. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, from a seed establishment standpoint uh there's good uh there's good studies especially in uh ag you know in, and especially in soils that are acidic that show uh over and over again that that will affect germination rates and i'm not aware of any off the top of my head um maybe dr woods can speak to that but specific to turf grass seeding uh where applied research has been done on that subject but yeah, I mean, to me, it's just common sense, right? That uh, we need to leave those. We should do pH uh, pH adjustments leading into a seeding window and not during a seeding window. I mean, if if you're talking about seeding, that would be a opportunity to mention that a nice time to make uh, serious adjustments to soil pH is at the time of establishment when you don't have any grass. You can use much higher rates, and you can till the the liming materials into the soil or if you're trying to acidify you could add sulfur uh, at much higher rates and uh, work that into the soil also but uh, I think raising pH is generally recommended if necessary but lowering soil pH when you have a calcareous soil just means you're mm -hmm. dissolving the soil so uh, at some point it just doesn't make sense uh, depending on uh, how calcareous your soil is. You, uh, let's let's talk about that in a practical sense. And, and Mike is absolutely right with, you know, uh, the the reason that when we talk about pH adjustments and seeding windows and things like that, the fallow period, right? Uh, when we are going to, you know, enter into a renovation period, you know, the more that we plan ahead, the longer the period that we have to do that. One, to obviously, you know, kill off the grass that's there or kill off whatever vegetation's there including weeds and continue to get those out, right? So that we have a, a clean uh, uh, soil to, stand, to establish into, but also as Mike has said, it's an opportunity to, you know, not just apply topically, right? Over the top necessarily, but uh, certainly, you know, with growings and projects like that, that we do on the sports field side, we'll, we'll do a lot of that because we can plan ahead, have soil placed, you know, months in advance or, you know, a few, at least a few months in advance and make those adjustments at that time leading into a seating window. So again, when I'm looking at adjustments on that side of things, if you're a little bit off, you know, I, I wouldn't worry so much about it, but you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, when you're down on the fives, low sixes, you know, there's, there's obviously some benefit there to coming up. And 
as Micah said, calcareous soils. There's a lot of great grass that's growing in calcareous soils all over the country, and I think it's it's really really tough um, for the average sports field manager, the average homeowner, to uh, to go down that road because it is one that you can never stop on. You're 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 always going to have to try and stay in front of it, and uh, to the extent that you can, um, really depends on the soil and its buffering capacity. What would be some of those strategies for an ambitious homeowner to lower their pH? Well, I mean, uh, sulfur applications is, are you know the first uh, first step that you can take uh, if you're really going to go down that road. Obviously, switching to ammonium sulfate as a nitrogen source is another one. Uh, you know, and then we get into you know uh, as has been alluded to on this server and some others. You know, citric acid applications can have you know some very short lived effects, but again, once you jump on that, it's you know it, it's kind of like a you know prescription drug that you're never going to stop taking if you want to go down that road and try your best at maintaining a a pH that is at what you would consider to be a a desirable level or a more desirable level than you know something in the high sevens low eights kind of thing. So, uh, with that said, you know on the sulfur side, you really need to be careful because. Uh, you know, no more than about five pounds per thousand in, in a single application. Um, and it, the, you know, lower cut and the more stress that's on the turf um, can cause, you know, it, there's a, there's a definitely a, a margin of error that uh, is, is very slim with those applications. You need to be careful. And the other thing too, that's, you know, very important with those applications is you need heat, right? You need heat and water for that uh, acidification reaction to occur within the soil. So again, you're on grass that, you know, maybe not in the healthiest state you're uh, applying a uh, you know a, uh, a a material that has the potential to you know cause some issues if you're not careful with it so i would just always caution people if they're going to do that uh, especially with sulfur is you know try to make those applications um you know if you can during establishment as michael alluded to and then if you if you can back off the citric acid applications uh they're not for everybody and i know that they'll be uh i'm interested to hear what micah has to say about that um because it is uh, it is it is a little bit different and avant-garde uh so to speak and again one that you're making you know applications on a monthly basis right just to stay uh on the ball with that or didn't spin didn't you at one point have uh some sort of acid injection system? Yeah, I had, uh, it was a company called Fairway, you know, spelled with a PH out of Chicago. And then the guy, that company wouldn't, wouldn't make it small enough for me to do, you know, three sports fields to inject my irrigation system. They were looking at golf courses and huge pump systems. So uh, this other guy started his own company and uh, it's called Growing Solutions. So they're out there, but yeah, I had acid injected into my uh, my main, but you know my pH was was in the nines. You know there at the Colts, it was yeah. it was really really high, and everything I've done to get it down didn't work. So I started looking into a, messing with my water because my city water was at ten point one pH that mm -hmm. I was watering the fields with. So that's what got me interested in in, in throwing that acid in there. And, and remember, this is like oh gosh, 25, 28 years ago. When I started doing this, and no one else was doing it on sports fields, they didn't have those. They didn't have a pump small enough that would handle all the acid to go through it. So I had to get with my my father-in-law, who worked at Phillips and did all that acid stuff here at Phillips 66, and he knew what kind of pump to get, and that's what I had to go to. And then I made it automatic. I put a a pH uh, tester in my in my main, and and I could dial it in right where I wanted to. And uh, you can see the, you know, instantly see the color and the growth and everything else just changed like overnight. But I also found out really interesting when I had when I had bluegrass and I got dollar spot or, or uh, you know, brown patch on it. If I turned it down, if I made it uh, the lower the pH, it would kill all the fungus. And I started mm. playing around with that and then. You know, a year later, we went to Bermuda, and I still used it for the Bermuda. But, yeah, so uh, the guy started a company. Um, Mr. Schaefer is his name, and it's it's Growing Solution. He's actually yeah. on the site, but, yeah. Did you, yeah. Did you notice a change over time of the soil pH, 
or do you just attribute that to your results to the lower water pH? no it, it did it didn't change anything in my soil too much it, it it would take probably years and maybe eons for it to change the soil ph right because you're just you're just affecting the water but what i noticed is that the plant whatever was in the soil if the ph was too high and this and the plant couldn't uptake all the nutrients as soon as i watered it with that that the ph being at 6.4 sometimes i'd go to 6.2 it would immediately immediately wake up and green up the next day i walk in it'd be green so you know you notice you notice your grass when you're out there and 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 you you mow your lawn your home your lawn and then after a good rain it greens up without you doing anything without you fertilizing or doing anything and you get that nice green right for maybe four five six days or whatever and that's telling me that you know the back then the ph of rain was 6.4 right so rainwater is around 6.4 and i've tested it and sometimes it goes up and in different areas but that tells me some draw to your ph if the rainwater so that that kind of just played a big role in my head thinking wow when it rains you know my grass is really green so that's the concept i had is like okay it's in the water so that's that's what made me started going that way in that direction yeah but it's night and day night and day difference i mean they're still using that system and it just took me a 55 gallon drum and it, that, that drum would last me all year it would last me all year on on three natural grass fields. Yeah, it's definitely a problem uh, on you know with uh, I'm sure your water source there. You said the city was 10.1, and you know another issue that we have here, particularly in the Midwest, you know uh, aquifers, well water. You know a lot of irrigation systems are are based on that, especially for you know sports fields and, and areas of larger scale. And so all those are limestone aquifers and and have you know loads and loads of bicarbonate that's in them higher pHs, right, and, you know, other minerals that could become deposited and when those aren't flushed, right, uh, that becomes, uh, you know, a big time issue. So interesting to hear the the early the early days of growing solutions. Yeah, the, those are good guys over there. So, um, hey, learn something new today. My next question was, how does the soil structure, if you have like a sand versus silt versus clay, does that affect how how much... Or how long it would take to change my pH over time? Yeah, so I mean, soil capacity is going to have an influence, uh, or, or excuse me, I should say this is uh, physical characteristics of the soil are going to have uh, an influence on CEC, and CEC uh, is you know uh, basically how the soil is going to buffer out, you know, part of the buffering system within the soil along with free calcium for pH, right? So. Uh, parent material becomes uh, a huge factor here. So, right, uh, as Micah was saying, with calcareous soils, right, with that free carbon or free calcium carbonate, that's going to uh, lend itself to higher pH soils. We know that uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of sands here, at least in the Midwest, are, are definitely uh, calcareous in parent material. And uh, throughout other parts of the, uh, the country, you know, less so. So I think that's something that uh, when we start examining uh you know soil physical characteristics we can make some determinations there but it's really uh in concert with just as uh, as mike alluded to here at the top when we're looking at soil tests you know i would want to look at the soil uh ph and the soil cec together and then we can make some inferences about soil physical char char characteristics and from there you know that might inform how we're going to uh, go about fertilizing just from a standpoint of uh how we expect you know, certain nutrients to behave in the soil and how long uh, we can expect to get, uh, you know, uh, response from applications, things like that. So from your experience to me, working with sports fields, you know, local high schools, how are you, how are you using pH adjustment in your programs, if any, um, as a recommendation for like your parks or your school systems? Is that mainly done on the front end, like you were saying, that you want to incorporate it um, if you're, you know, say transitioning to a different turf and doing that during the fallow period? Or is that an ongoing thing that you're recommending for, you know, the schools to go that they should, you know, maybe do 25 pounds of lime, you know, in the middle of the summer or something like that each year? Yes, yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, so our, our 
you know, clientele varies by location, geography, soil types, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I'll kind of take it from new construction to a field that's, you know, 10, 15, 20 years old. And on new construction, you know, one is writing good specifications so that, you know, the materials that we're getting into work with uh, it can either be amended there uh, on site, can be amended during the blending process potentially if we know the sources and um, if need be, right, we've got a, lo a really good uh, testing program in place. So the higher end fields, you know, our, our pre-construction testing is pretty rigorous so that we know what we're going to get and aren't having to do a whole lot of adjustments after the fact. And, and again, some of that too comes down to cost and material availability, especially in this day and age where, you know, uh, again, for here, uh, let's just take, uh, you know, Ohio and the Midwest, you know, a, a suitably sized USGA sand, uh, if you want to get uh, silica sand, right, that's not a calcareous uh, parent material, uh, you're talking about, you know, $100, $110 a ton shipped in here uh, versus, you know, a calcareous sand that's available locally in most locations for, you know, somewhere between $35 and $45 a ton, right? So the economics of a project make a big difference uh, when it comes down to that. And then the agronomics, you know, usually come second. You deal with what you have and uh, make the best out of it. So, you know, the other thing too, it's been alluded to this and it's become a bigger deal. I know Mike has talked about it before, but, you know, water testing, right? So understanding the source of water that you're gonna be working with and if there's any adjustments that need to be made there, uh, on the front end, you know, having those conversations sooner rather than later so you don't get into the growing period and you're like, hey, how come this won't grow? What's going on here? And then you find out after the fact it's water, right? So uh, that's just from my golf background and, um, you know, a, a lot of time spent um, dealing with, you know, re really, really poor quality water in a variety of situations and understanding the effect it has on turf. So I'm glad that, you know, Spins talked about it, Micah, to, you know, to uh, his points on uh, his blogs and things like that. So. The, when it comes to existing fields, you know, the conversation usually centers, um, you know, something around what, what Micah talked about at the top there with those four uh, determinants, right, within uh, a soil testing report. So, you know, really trying to help folks understand, okay, hey, what are going to be the limiting factors here and how do we deal with each of these, you know, in sequence and with uh, the greatest priority. So pH is one uh, when it comes to correcting, uh, especially at scale, Right, so you know, if we're talking about multiple fields and, and large acreage, I unless it's something egregious, it's not necessarily something that we're looking to deal with, you know, straight away with uh, lime, unless it's absolutely needed. Again, if we're in the very low sixes or in the fives, uh, you know, we might try to uh, to move that up, and and certainly we don't get a lot of uh, native soil situations, at least here uh, through the Midwest and and going out east, you know, towards the coast that are, uh, you know, so alkaline that we're, you know, seven, three, seven, four plus, something like that. We'll manage around those parameters, uh, you know, again, with nitrogen source selections. And then also too, um, you know, understanding how uh, that soil is going to behave both physically, you know, from a drainage perspective, and then also too, uh, with CEC and its ability to buffer uh, on the backside with, with different nutrients. So all those things, uh, I, I hate to sound, you know, uh, if, if Ray, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but it, pH, pH is not as huge of a concern when it comes to managing turf. I believe uh, that from my golf days, uh, and, and Mike has hit on it too, you know, between 5.5 and 8.5, you can grow good grass. You just need to know how to adjust off of what you have, right, and spend that time, effort, and money on things that are more tangible and going to have a greater effect on the overall health of the turf. Right on. I guess that's a good segue if you want to jump to the other, what, 50% or 75% per se. Um, if you want to touch on P and K. If I'm looking, I know the male 3 test is pretty common. Yet, say at um, Waypoint Analytical or Spectrum Analytics, um, lots of uh, universities standardize that type of test. I'm look If I get a soil test and I'm looking at my levels... What are some alarm bells of I need to do something for P and K um, if my levels are low and also what to do if my levels come up, you know, say extremely high, say 100 parts per million of phosphorus? Yeah, good question. Uh, so naturally, the soil test results, uh, the numbers that you get on a soil report uh, depend on what chemical method 
is used at the laboratory, which is usually called an extractant. And these have names like Olson, Malik-3, ammonium acetate. Citric acid is used sometimes, acetic acid, various things like that. I kind of like Malik-3 because it's used commonly in agriculture and consequently at the large testing laboratories in the United States, Malik-3 is pretty common and it's what's called a universal extractant, which means it can work across a wide range of soils, wide range of pHs, uh, and it, it can do macronutrients and you get micronutrients for free also because it, it's all run on the same machine that analyzes the results. So I don't really worry about micronutrient results too much, but you get it for free. And, it, and so you can get a really nice comprehensive soil test report when you use Malik-3. And it's been widely researched. So those numbers are ones that I talk about a lot because people can often take those Malik-3 numbers and then if they have a different test, they can sort of try to figure out what it would be if they'd used if they've used ammonium acetate or, or used a different kind of extractant. Um, certainly for phosphorus, the primary concern, uh, if you don't have enough, your growth is going to be severely limited or just completely stop. So having a, a phosphorus deficiency is a very bad thing. And at the same time, having an excess of phosphorus, the soil has a limited ability to store phosphorus. And once the soil is saturated with phosphorus, it can't hold it anymore. And then the phosphorus that is applied as fertilizer could run off or leach. And the problem with phosphorus is it's normally very low in natural water bodies, but if the phosphorus gets elevated slightly in natural water bodies, it can lead to uh, al algal blooms or what's called eutrophication, I think is the technical term, yep. which I think means low oxygen in the water. So phosphorus is an environmental concern, but from a plant perspective, you're, you're not going to have very much good turf if you don't have enough phosphorus. So on the Malik-3 extractant, I would say, yeah, if you see 100, that's a good number. I was going to say, if you see 100, you could just say, don't apply phosphorus for a while. And if you, uh, I mean, on the low end, it's going to be something like 10 or 20. Um, and if you're anything in between that, you'd think that you're kind of okay. But if I'm down around 10 or 20, then I start thinking about maybe, maybe I would add a little bit of phosphorus. And... I, I think some people know who I am and I write on my blog and I do my own work. And recently I've, I've seen some of the questions on this server. So I've seen some of the questions people ask and they post a soil report and kind of ask what to do about it. And I've seen that where people are looking to, at these as a snapshot in time. And I think people sometimes read too much into it that just from a, a snapshot in time soil test that you can make some really good decisions. And I don't really think of the value of soil testing quite like that. I think the real value that you would get in soil testing is testing the same soil in exactly the same way sequentially over time and seeing what changes. So um, then you can see if the soil phosphorus is going up or going down. And if you see that, then you can realize what the impact of the grass growth is and what the impact of the management practices are. So we could, I could very generally say, like for phosphorus on the low end, 10 or 20, I might add a little bit more. And if it's at 100 or above on Malik 3, I'm not going to add any more. I mean, that's, a, that's an easy way to do it. What sort of strategies are there to, or if there is anything even needed to lower it if it's at 100? Collect clippings and wait. That, <laughs> Don't. That, and that's it? That's... Move. You can move. That's <laughs> that's pretty basic. Yeah, you can an excavator. Yeah, there no, you go. Yeah. yeah, I I didn't even think of collecting clippings, but yeah, that I mean that's what happens over time. So I have from the golf side, I have clients in Japan, um, and I think because Japan has volcanic soils, so in agriculture, I think those type of soils uh, tend to bind phosphorus and it may not be so plant available. So in agriculture, it's customary in Japan to apply a lot of phosphorus and that kind of carries over into golf. And so on golf courses, there are often soil testing clients I have in Japan who have 200, 300, 400 parts per million phosphorus on, uh, on a Malik-3 soil test extractant. And over a 
uh, more than a decade, that will go down to where these clients now they've gone from like 300 down to about 70 or 50 parts per million. And that all happens just by harvesting clippings. And that's so with these type of situations, I'm just looking at the time series, how the phosphorus is changing over time. And when I think that it's going to be approaching, because we can look at the rate of decline. So as it, as it gets closer and closer to the level at which I expect a plant response, then we just start adding a little bit of phosphorus in to the, to the recommendation. So what sort of time frame would you recommend in between soil tests? Like you said, if you're uh, doing them the same method each time, how long should someone wait to see that kind of change in time? I, I think it's standard for soils that have, a, a, have some clay and silt in it. But so, so we're not talking sand-based root zones now. We're talking soils where you have silt and clay. Um, in that case, if you're doing soil testing properly, I would think do it every three years. But I understand that the people that are listening to this are probably uh, turfgrass aficionados, and they might be quite interested to do it once a year. But in general, I would say to save money, uh, and still get all the value that you need to out of soil testing for these type of soils, then you could do it every three years. And if you're in a sand-based root zone, I like to do it annually. Yeah, okay. and I think that's, that's a function of PEC, right? So there's there's that aspect of it. With P, obviously, it's an anion, so we're, that's not as much of a concern there. But I think the things that uh, also are important, as Micah alluded to, are uh, uh, you know a standardized testing method that you use and repeat over and over again. And I think there's a really good slide uh, that uh, Dr. Bill Kreuzer puts all in a lot of his soil testing presentations that's pretty remarkable in showing how stratified right P is within the soil, right? So you know the depth uh, the depth of uh, your plug matters greatly, right? So if you're you know kind of careless and you get a bunch of plugs that are maybe only you know the top one there one and a half inches of soil versus a full depth of you know four inches as we commonly take in turf grass that you may have as much as two or two and a half X the value reported of P uh, within your soil just because uh, it's held much more closely to the top and higher concentrations. So that'd be one thing. I guess one other thing that I, I wanted to ask of of Micah is you know when uh, you hear uh, somebody in the industry, regardless of their their job, say that uh, your nutrients are locked up. How does that make you feel, and and what would you respond to with with that? I'm always I'm curious to hear. What a great question! Uh, when I first started my viridescent blog back in 2009, that was the thing that I just kept writing about over and over. And I, I wrote that. about it so many times from like 2009 to 2014 that I kind of forgot all the ways that I've answered it. But the basically that's that's not a real thing. Um, but it's what you hear from the fertilizer. I mean, I mean people can believe it, but I don't believe it. Um, and I might be wrong, but I know there's people that want to believe it. They like to buy products. They like to believe that their soil has tons of phosphorus, but it's not available. Their soil has tons of calcium, but it's not available. Um, I, I think they're, they're getting bamboozled by suppliers. And of course, it's in the interest of uh, some companies to sell more product to try to keep that uh, myth going that, that things are really complicated. And I just don't think it's that complicated. So. The way that I answer it is this, and, and I think the question is about, can you repeat the question about things not being well, just, available, right? Well, just, yeah, yeah. You know, what, it, when, when somebody is confronted with that, you know, if they're listening here and they're a homeowner, they're a sports field manager, so they might be hearing that, you know, on the internet and in the video, they might be hearing that at, uh, you know, uh, a continuing education talk, they might be hearing that from a supplier or distributor, you know, how... How should they be thinking about that when that statement's made by somebody? Is that, you know, there should is be it a trying lot to solve of... a problem that, that's not, that doesn't exist, I guess, is my question. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so I think when they hear something like that, a lot of alarm bells should start going off in their mind and they should say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, know, you don't have to tell anybody, but just think to yourself that maybe that's not quite the case. And I think basically you can just trust a 
standard soil test interpretation. And, and I tell people, so I answered this in the context of, of soil testing, because it's usually mm -hmm. the question is asked also in the context of soil testing, because they'll say, they'll start talking about their nutrients not being available, where their soil's messed up and nutrients aren't available. And so it's like, if you, if you don't do any soil testing whatsoever, I think it makes sense to supply 100% of the nutrients that the grass could use, uh, because I, I would just, just, I don't know what the soil can supply. So I think it makes sense for high level turf grass management to not assume that the soil can supply something. And if we don't test the soil, just supply 100% of what the plant can use. And in the case where we do do soil testing, I think it is a, a, the wrong type of interpretation to start saying things are locked up or unavailable or something. That's just not really the way it is. We're just looking at quantities. So, so either trust your proper soil test interpretation, which is by using something like MLSN. And if, if you're not going to trust the soil test interpretation that says that this is enough, then I would encourage people to just don't even bother with soil testing because it's just confusing them. And just, if, if you believe that your nutrients are unavailable and you don't trust the soil test, then just go back to the default of supplying 100% of plant use. And if people would look at the numbers of what the nutrient use, of, of what the fertilizer use rates are, certainly with, for professionally managed turf, the nutrient use rates are such that the fertilizer supplied is higher than simply applying 100% of plant use. So I have no problem recommending 100% of plant use and just skipping soil testing if you want to do that, because that would still lead to a decrease in uh, fertilizer applied, and it would guarantee that you have 100% of what the grass could use. In that, I don't know what the situation is for home lawns, but uh, I know for, at least for golf course turf, that would be the case. So that's, yeah, yeah I can, and I can answer that question in like 50 different ways. <laughs> I think I've read them all going back to 2009. So I, yeah. I tried to tee you up there because uh, I, I do think that it's, it's an issue that comes up fairly frequently. And again, I, I think anytime that um, you have fear of being used as a, a sales tactic or, you know, uh, questioning what seems to be common sense, then yeah, you've got some issues that uh, need to be corrected. Yeah, I think uh, people shouldn't get their soil tests done by fertilizer companies, for one, because you have, I mean, if you, if, I've had people contact me from all over the world. I'm thinking of somebody particular who contacted me from Germany, and they had a, a fertilizer company who's based out of Memphis do their soil testing uh, for them through their proprietary proprietary system. And it comes back that they have all these problems. and there's like eight different products recommended. And the person's asking me with a straight face about what to make of it. And I'm like, well, what do you expect? If you get your fertilizer, if you get your soil tested by a fertilizer company, that they're going to interpret it for the purpose of recommending products. And I have people from Europe all the time. I mean, it's less so from the U.S. now, but I, I know a lot of people from the U.S. get their soil tests done by fertilizer companies too, but uh, ICL in Europe does a lot of soil testing and I have so many people contact me and the recommendations are all for a lot of fertilizer based on the soil tests. And I'm, it, it doesn't make sense to me to hire the fertilizer company to tell you what to apply. So Micah, you had mentioned supplying 100% of what the plant uses. Uh, what are those levels? I, how much should I actually be applying? And also, I'd assume that also changes by my plant type. Is that correct? Yeah, it's so basically the grass can't grow any more than the nitrogen rate because the growth of the grass is limited by nitrogen. You, you don't really get growth stimulus by applying boron or um, manganese or potassium the, or phosphorus that those elements on their own don't cause the grass to grow nitrogen will cause the grass to grow more. And because we know what the dry matter content is of healthy turf grass, and we can just make the assumption that we're growing healthy turf grass because that's what our objective is, so we're always striving to do that, 
a lot of turf has 4% nitrogen in the dry matter of the leaves. So it's a relatively straightforward to know that if we've applied, for example, one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, then the maximum grass, now we're, we're ignoring mineralization from soil organic matter, but that's something that we can, we can consider also. And, and I'm ignoring nitrogen that comes from irrigation water, but that is something that could be considered also. But let's just look only at the nitrogen from fertilizer. If we apply one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, that is the absolute maximum amount of nitrogen that the grass could use, which means that's the maximum growth that the grass could have. And we know that healthy uh, Kentucky bluegrass, for example, will have about half as much potassium in it as nitrogen. So we know instantly, we know that our potassium, maximum potassium use right now is half a pound of potassium per thousand square feet. And we know that the phosphorus content would be about uh, one eighth of the potassium and we know, sorry, one eighth of the nitrogen. We know that calcium would be about one eighth of the nitrogen. We know that magnesium would be about one twentieth of the nitrogen. So simply from knowing what our nitrogen rate is, which I think everybody can figure out, we can instantly know what our maximum use rate is of all the other elements. And so that's what I'm saying. If, if you don't soil test and just want to make sure that the grass is supplied with enough of everything, that's a very straightforward way to do it. And that is called the Scandinavian precision fertilization method. And, or sometimes it's abbreviated as SPF. And there's an excellent document about that that is available for reading. It's like 20 or 25 pages. And you can find that by searching for that, or I've linked to it from my website also. But I recommend that if you, if you want to believe that nutrients aren't available in the soil, apply that amount or, heck, do 110%, 120% of, of the nitrogen. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the way I fertilize. I mean, I took a soil test of all my sports fields 15 years ago and haven't took another one. Uh, that's exactly how I fertilize. I mean, you can see, you know, from uh, aesthetic and color and stuff like that. So I look at a soil test and I want to know my pH and I want to know my... CCs, and then I also want to know my phosphorus level, and then I throw the thing in the trash, and then I, I, I calculate what it needs, and I know that I don't want to go over on phosphorus, especially on native soil fields, so I don't want to touch, and I don't want to touch phosphorus, because that's one thing, you know, it just doesn't leach, so everything else, I do exactly what Micah said, I never, I don't do a soil test anymore, I just play by ear. Are you using granular fertilizer or foliar, or does that matter? Yeah, I mean, th this year, so, so we, you know, the company I worked for lost the contract. So now I'm working for the company that got the contract there, TU, and they take care of everything. And they don't believe in granular. So they're spraying. They're spraying everything. So they sprayed everything last year. And I can tell the huge difference on the fields that they don't last as long. They don't, you know, they wear out, they got wear spots. I might have to sprig some spots this year. So, you know, foliar is good for in some cases, but I've always liked granular. And then you can spoon feed a little bit of iron here and there, you know, and some micros, but uh, other than that, I'm mainly granular. So Mike, uh, moving along to potassium or uh, K on the soil test, similar to how I phrased phosphorus, what kind of levels should I be looking out for, um, both on the low side that I need to supply some more potassium or on the high side? Since I already gave a long answer about phosphorus relating to the testing methods and so on, the same things apply. And I'll just say that the numbers that I would be looking at for Malik 3, for the low, I'd look at about 30. And for the high, uh, somewhere 75, 80. And I would absolutely not be concerned at all if it was higher than that. Yeah, if it was down around 30, I would add some more. And are there any concerns with uh, potassium levels being so high, say like 300 parts per million? I'd consider myself lucky. I mean, I, I would expect a, a lawn or a sports field with 300. It's like, that's a lot of free fertilizer. I wouldn't be trying to make it go down. Um, I would just be grateful. So moving along to calcium, 
We don't necessarily need to touch on the low side because I know that's quite rare and usually you'll see it has a pH issue. But I also kind of want to touch on the high side. Um, I know, for instance, uh, I've seen calcium numbers on Texas soils come in at like 8,000 parts per million. Is that of concern? And what, if anything, should be done about that? If you get calcium that's that high, it's probably uh, an error in the test by using something like malic 3 that's acidic and it dissolves some calcium carbonate that's in the soil. So you, so the number is, you would just like kind of throw that away. And what that means is you've got plenty of calcium and there's nothing to worry about. But there's no concerns with levels being that high? No concern by me. There was a, there's a question in the... Uh, ask questions on live one pound in what time period which i assume is related to my uh nitrogen rate thing and and i don't mean by any time period i just mean uh for whatever time period you expect that one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet to be to be used then that's the same time period over which you need to apply half a pound of potassium and 0.125 pounds of phosphorus and 0.125 pounds of calcium and 0.05 pounds of uh, magnesium and so on. So like, let's say that your lawn is going to be, uh, you know, two pounds per year or something, then you just expect that that's what it's going to be over the course of, of a year. Demay for sulfur, if I'm getting low numbers at six parts per million, say, what sort of strategies can I use to increase my sulfur? Um, and at what point, I guess, should I stop worrying about my sulfur levels? You know, I think uh, if you are in a soil that does have uh, lower sulfur, you know, a couple of the things uh, that you can do, right, is uh, you wouldn't immediately just go to elemental sulfur applications. I, don't, I, I wouldn't advocate that, you know, but from a standpoint of, you know, looking at different products that are out there, you could you, you you could use it if you had to, but I would not recommend using elemental sulfur. So, um, you know, sulfate-based fertilizers are very inefficient at getting sulfur into the soil. I think uh, in that case, right, if you're trying to target a, a soil level, I think the critical level that um, you'd find in some text is anywhere from about 12 to 15 parts per million. Um, so do you have, or have you, I, mean, I don't think I've ever seen one that low down in the single digits ever dr woods have you ever seen yeah there's sing you know the the mlsn for sulfur is seven i think and it that's quite common in sandy soils sure but basically sulfur we're measuring sulfate and uh that's kind of like nitrogen in the soil where it doesn't uh i question whether we really even want to be testing the soil for that so much but sulfur is quite important uh, in terms, the grass uses it in pretty high quantities. So it's something that I think could use a lot more research. But basically what happens when I'm getting a soil that has a relatively low sulfur, um, I look at how much organic matter there is first, because you'll get a lot of sulfur mineralized from organic matter. So if you have plenty of organic matter in the soil, then I just figure it's not a big deal. If you don't have so much organic matter in the soil, then I can't figure out where the grass is ever going to get any sulfur. So in that case, I recommend just being conscious of what fertilizers you're applying and trying to apply sulfate-containing fertilizers. I'm not trying to adjust the soil level whatsoever. I'm just trying to supply the grass with enough sulfur. And so then you, you start looking at things like ammonium sulfate, potassium sulfate, iron Amazing. sulfate, uh, calcium sulfate, Magnesium sulfate, um, yep, yep. Magnesium sulfate and, and that sort of thing. But generally, like I, yeah, it's it's something that I think wasn't a big deal when there was more air pollution because there used to be a lot of <laughs> acid rain. There used to be a lot of atmospheric deposition of sulfur. And now all around the world, that's not the case anymore. And at the same time, we get a increase in the number of sand root zones that are built sand root zones inherently don't have as much organic matter in them and they won't have as much plant available sulfur in them so it's something that likely is it could be that it's an undiagnosed problem in a lot of cases or or it could be that we could get some grass response to sulfur 
and it's something that I'm just not sure that the soil testing uh, is a really good way to assess that. Yeah, but, and and the only other thing I was going to say with and trying to qualify my answer a little bit on the using sulfates, right? So I'm thinking in sand-based root zones, locate and exchange, and you do have to be careful in those situations, especially you know highly compacted soils, things like that, where those could lead to black layer things like that. But in a homeowner sense, not so concerned about it. So if that is the case uh, on a a, a soil that's got more clay and silt, then absolutely, um, you know, dive into those. And as Mike was saying, you know, you'll use those more as a supplemental tool as opposed to uh, increasing uh, or banking soil sulfur. One other thing, uh, Demay, that I wanted to touch on, Demay, that I wanted to touch on, um, I know you had mentioned it earlier, but gypsum has sulfur sulfate in it. Is yeah, calcium that, sulfate. Is that released as plant available sulfate? Yeah, I mean that would be considered a a sulfur source if you. It's the sulfate. It's going to be uh, one of the more readily available sulfates that you know. Just like a, like as we were talking about before, magnesium sulfate. He even mentioned calcium sulfate. So that's uh, that's gypsum. We've got a question about copper sulfate to drop the pH. Oh boy, uh, I wouldn't because copper like in tiny doses is okay but otherwise it's it's toxic and uh if you really want to if you really want to drop the ph do aluminum sulfate oh gosh <laughs> but but that's something you don't put on grass hydrangeas <laughs> you you might treat your uh you might treat soil and then let let that react for quite a while but i think copper sulfate you couldn't apply it at high enough rates to really have a serious acidifying effect um, without causing without damage, turn, turning your grass brown, very brown, yes, and turning it into a, a fire hazard quickly. To me, we had a question on what would the potassium plan be for a malic three level of 106 parts per million. The optimal level on this test says 150 through 240. Um, Micah, you had kind of alluded to like, you know, above 75, 80, you wouldn't necessarily be worried about it. What sort of strategy would you use on that? What Micah's strategy would be, I don't need to apply potassium for at least one year. That, that would be Micah's interpretation of this. Yeah. And Ryan's interpretation of this would be uh, something similar uh, that uh, not knowing what type of turf is growing on this, you know, the only other thing I'd be cautious about is if there's, you know, high rates of precipitation in the area or something like that, you might get, uh, you know, potassium be a little bit more mobile pushing through this. It's 10.6 at EC, so it's probably on the sandier side of uh, the soil textile triangle. So it'd be the only thing I'd really be concerned with if it, you know, if you're really, really worried about it. but uh, I, I think the other thing that Dr. Woods has, has written ad nauseum about is, uh, you know, where are what, what studies show uh, that uh, increasing K rates, you know, show a plant response, and you'd be hard pressed to find them. Yeah, if and I look at the phosphorus too, and that's fine, mm -hmm. and the pH is fine, and that's a nice amount of organic so it's, matter. So it's my pretty nice soil. Yeah, so my recommendation, my fertilizer recommendation, if I got this soil test report, would be apply the rate of nitrogen that you require to create the the growth rate and the color that you're looking for. And that's it. So, Micah, for, you said like roughly a year of no potassium. They're not doing another soil test for another, you know, two or three years here. Then year two or three, would you pick up more of the, you know, half potassium to nitrogen ratio then in years two and three or suggestion mm. of sampling and kind of going you know seeing what the how much the levels have dropped or what would be your recommendation i can't encourage people enough i expect there's a lot of uh, variability in the way people collect soil samples and mm -hmm. i can only encourage you if you're testing over time to number one be vigilant about the depth that you go um, because the soil test levels change by depth 
So <laughs> what we're really interested in is how the plant is using potassium, for example, over time. And if you sample at, at four inches this year and three inches next year, then you're not going to be able to answer that question or you could get misleading results. So uh, I would just say, let's say for lawn aficionados, why don't you, why don't I say that my answer would be um, treat your lawn like professional turf, test it annually until you realize that it's not changing very much and you're comfortable with how it's changing over time and then start transitioning to a two or three year sampling schedule that would be my practical recommendation and and i think you'd be fine for three years but you could test again but the main thing about testing again on an annual basis is just make sure that you test at the exact depth and i would go i would go so far as to kind of go from macro to micro here that you know the areas that you select i think are very important right so uh you know trying to identify if you can or if you have the wherewithal to do it uh, you know, good performing areas or well performing areas of the lawn, and if there are poor performing areas, separate those out and, and you know try to have some sort of demarcation, you know, within the lawn that you can sample and compare those results uh, of good performing grass versus poor performing grass, and it, it, even take it a step further, you know, a good uh, poor and average, right, to give you a little bit of a uh, variance there, see what variances there are, and you can adjust off of that perhaps, right? Especially as you get more and more testing data. If you're taking one composite test, is that how you would suggest going about it is kind of taking, you know, like a a good average and then maybe slightly below average and combining all three of those? Or would you just say take an average single core from your average portion my so my preferred method in this case would be to separate those out and test those individually and not make those a composite right so do a composite of just the good area do a composite of just the poor performing area and sample those and again look for any abnormalities between the two right to see if you know that that is uh, telling a story or you know then we can go to look at other issues outside of uh, soil chemistry that could be causing those issues but it's a, it's a good way to rule those things out and or know that you've got, uh, you know, different soils that are behaving differently, especially, you know, we see this, you know, to put it in the homeowner's context, we see this often where, uh, you know, especially in homes that were built in the last, you know, say 25 to 35 years that, you know, there's typically poor soil in the, in the back of the home, right, on the backyard and better soil up front, right? So there was soil that was imported for the front yard to make it look nice and pretty and all the crap, you know, essentially was pushed to the back and you're left to deal with that. So you know, that's that's one way that you might see disparities uh, in that particular sense in a, in a real world example. You know, the other part, too, I can't stress enough why, you know, Dr. Woods is saying what he is about sampling depth. You know, we talked before about stratification of phosphorus in the soil and how that can manifest itself. But more importantly, I think the point that he was trying to get to is that, you know, the lab, when it looks at your results, you know, it's giving you a, a, a parts per million um you know, value that, that your soil has of, you know, whatever that nutrient might be. And where that's derived from, right, is that, you know, they're, uh, all of agriculture is based on what's called a furrow slice. A furrow slice is six inches deep of soil across an acre and is said to weigh two million pounds, right? So it's pretty simple math. You take the parts per million to divide it by two, and that's what we're left with is our soil test value. Well, in turf, typically the recommendation is going to be sample at four inches, and that's one of the reasons you check that turf box is most labs will then calculate and correct for that and say that, you know, your four-inch sample is now 1.33 million pounds, right, as opposed to 2 million, and they'll make those uh, calculations based off of that. So if you're sampling at some other depth or if you have a soil test that, you know, asks you to check your sampling depth and you check the incorrect one, you might get uh, soil test results that are skewed either high or low based on which one you check versus what you sampled at. So that's why that piece is so critical, uh, again, in, in being consistent with it. You know, the, the last piece I'll say is this, is that, um, you know, again, there's a lot of data on that report and data is useless if you don't use it to take some sort of action, right? And sometimes that means doing nothing. And in this case, uh, what I would advocate for from a simplistic approach, uh, and I, I think that Dr. Woods would probably advocate for the same thing here, is that, you know, if there is one glaring issue on that soil report, but there's other issues that maybe you need addressed or things like that, is try to deal with one thing at a time if you can and see, you know, how that moves the needle. Uh, include check plots if you can at all, right? So cover an area and leave it untreated to understand um, how 
inputs that you're adding into the system are you know uh, causing the grass to respond. I think that's a really crucial thing. When you start to throw the kitchen sink at things, you know, there's uh, some confirmation bias that might occur that, oh, well, you know, it wasn't just one thing, it was all the things. And maybe you only needed one thing though, right? So uh, I think that's one thing too, that you can uh, maybe focus in on your biggest issue, your biggest problem, right? That if there is uh, a problem on that soil test and just work on that uh, and, and work yourself out of that and into the next issue and go from there. Well, Great I advice. think- I think that's a, a pretty good stopping point. Um, I want to thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Dr. Woods, uh, for jumping on, really kind of breaking down all things soil tests. Um, and I'm going to end the recording there, and we can hang around and still chat if anybody's still around.